God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that we can trust in you. We can put our hope in you. I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls church would you begin to praise him because he is faithful would you begin to praise him because he's good would you begin to praise him because he's at work he's a good God he's worthy of our praise and I know that I know that you will never fail that's a promise that we can hold on to this morning that's a promise we can celebrate this morning that we can give God praise for this morning but I also know that for many in the season that we find ourselves in, with what we carried out of last year, with what we carried out of the year before that or the year before that, or even what we just picked up right now, the hurt, the disappointment, the brokenhearted, the fear for what is to come this year, the uncertainty from when the next paycheck will come, to worry about the child or the illness or the doctor's report or school or university or, or what this year looks like. 
I know that for many of us, we struggle to sing those words. We struggle to believe those words, that God is faithful. But I wanna encourage us, church, that that is okay. It's okay to find ourselves in that place of uncertainty, of fear, of doubt, of hurt, of shame. And what's even more encouraging is that we don't need to hide that from God this morning. And I want to invite us in this moment that as the Holy Spirit begins to minister to each and every single one of us, wherever it is that we find ourselves, there's an invitation from God for us this morning to just come as we are. Enter His throne room of grace. We will find the help that we need most in this moment right now. And I want to invite us to maybe, to maybe just put our hands out to our side if we are carrying something. Or maybe it is that, that you know what, you know, uh, God, I need you. I need to reach out. I need to reach out, God. Here I am. Help me. Or maybe we don't even have the strength to do either of those things. Maybe it's just to be, God, here I am. I don't have the words. I can't express what I'm feeling, but God, you know. And that is the truth that our loving Father knows that he sees you, that he leans in to listen, that he isn't too far away, that this, the thing that we are holding on to right now isn't too big for him, it doesn't scare him. It's not too small, it's not too trivial. It still matters. And this morning, we have an invitation just to lay that at God's feet and say, God, would you do what only you can do? Jesus, all across this place, as we stand in your presence, as we come to your feet, as we open ourselves up to you and what you are doing in this moment, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd meet each and every single one of us, that you will remind us, God, that you were faithful then, that you are faithful now, and that you will be faithful to the end of this age, that, God, you are a good God. You were a good God. You are a good God. You're still going to be a good God. That, God, you call us your children, that we are sons and daughters. God, would you remind us of that truth this morning? And church, just as we find ourselves in this space, I was just so, so reminded of the scripture that Paul writes. Philippians 1 verse 6 in the TPT version says, I pray with great faith for you, just as we have been right now. And this has been my prayer all week for us, for this moment. And it says this, because I am fully convinced. Can we fully convince ourselves that we are fully convinced of the goodness of God this morning? Because I'm fully convinced that the one who began this gracious work in you will faithfully continue the process. Will faithfully continue the process. That is God's promise for you and for me this morning. Let's hold on to that truth. God, as we stand in your word, we know that you will faithfully continue what you are doing in us and through us this morning. And our response, God, is gratitude. Our response, God, is praise. Our response, God, is lifting our voice and saying thank you. So all across this place, can that be our response? Come on, on the count of three, lift your voice. One, God is good. Two, He deserves our praise. Three, He is a good Father. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We glorify you. We worship you. You are faithful. You are good. Amen. Amen. I love that we get to spend time in God's presence. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that we get to be in the building together this morning. And if you are joining us online, we are so grateful that you are joining us online too. And as you're in the room, maybe just find someone, make, make eye contact with them, wish them Happy New Year, smile at them with your eyes because that's what we can do, wave at them. If you are online, now's your opportunity to maybe get yourself a new coffee or whatever it is. We are not jealous at all that you are still probably in your pajamas. We are grateful to be in the room this morning. Happy New Year, everyone. 2022. Can you believe it? We are here. It's so good to be in the building again this week. 
And if we haven't met yet, my name is Justin. And chances are, if we haven't met yet, then perhaps you are new and visiting us for the very first time today. And if you are new and visiting us for the first time, I'd love to take an opportunity to say welcome. We are so glad that you are here already. And we have a team of people um, at our Guest Connect Lounge that would love to meet you in person. We know it might be daunting to see a church of our size, but we have people that would want to be intentional about saying hello, finding out how we can um, start a journey with you, whatever that looks like in this season. But we also want to put something in your hand. We have a coffee with your name on it just for you. So you can join us after the service at our Guest Connect Lounge outside. Coffee and a sweet treat, like I said, is available for you. And just now, as we turn our hearts towards giving, I, I was so deeply challenged by the series that we finished our year off on last year called Uncomplicated. And towards the back end of that series, or it felt like a whole season of, of Uncomplicated, we looked at Uncomplicated Finances, and there was a, a sermon that Pastor Daniel did called The Principle of First. And I love this verse from Malachi that he spoke out of, and it's Malachi 3.10. As we turn our hearts towards giving, bring all the tithes into the storeroom so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the window of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it, put me to the test. Try it and put me to the test. As we come and, and we bring our offering in or our tithes into the storehouse, there's an invitation from God to test him. You see this morning, and it's no coincidence that the theme has been faithfulness. And that is a promise from God that he is faithful. So as we bring into the, the storehouse, he says, put me to the test and I'll show you how good I am. And I know sometimes it's difficult for us to give over and above, or maybe it's even difficult just to tithe. But there's an invitation again from our loving God to say, try it, put me to the test and we will receive a blessing. And I'd love to take an opportunity to pray for us as we do consider giving this morning. And if you are in the building, you'll see the various ways come up on screen of how you can give and those will be available online too. So God, as we give this morning, I thank you that you are a good God, that you invite us. There's an invitation from you to be a part of building your church in this practical way. God, as we give this morning, I thank you that you are going to use it to multiply and grow your kingdom, to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you might be wondering where Pastor Daniel is. They are still away on family holiday. They were up in the Drakensberg. Um, they are on their way back home now. So we are praying for safe travels. They are refreshed, ready to go. So if you do pray for them this week, just pray for a refreshing, for safe travel as they make their way home this week. And they'll be with us uh, shortly. But this, this Sunday, the 9th of January, the first Sunday in person, we are so honored to have Pastor Bobby joining us to bring God's word. So all across this place, could we stand to our feet as we have Pastor Bobby joining us this morning? Thank you, Justin. Wow, so good. Good morning, church. It's good to be with you, church, though gathered here and online. And with this being our second Sunday of the new year, I still get to wish you happy new year because it's still early day. So a very happy new year from both Pedro and myself. And we are wishing you and praying that you get to experience everything that God has purposed and designed for you in 2020. I love how the new year represents the opportunities of new beginnings. You heard me say that I love Mondays. Mondays is always a fresh start. You know, when you mess up on that gym program or your running program or your eating program, you think, I can't wait for Monday to come around. And then you blow it by Tuesday and you've got to wait for the next Monday. So, but that's okay. And so the new year always represents new opportunities, new beginnings, fresh starts, fresh resolutions. And that is so good for us as a people because it helps us to believe again, to dream again, and to imagine how things can be. But if we are honest here, and it's the only way we're going to be at Edge Church, just the second week into the new year, for many of us, you may feel that you have brought some of 2021 into the new year. The most obvious one being the, pand the pandemic, right? Who would have thought that we would be bringing Omicron with us into 2022? And for others, Perhaps you brought different things into 2022. Maybe you brought regret, shame, unforgiveness, something that you've been struggling with, an addiction, into 2022, and those challenges are still facing you. This morning, and this is what I want you to hear from me, 
I've come to bring God's word to you because this is what I've discovered on my journey, that God's word has the power to redirect our path. That's unbelievable. That's what I'm talking about, to be reminded of that. It has the power to intercept where you are. Maybe you're on a destructive path, and a path of unforgiveness, a path of feeling overwhelmed, in despair. God's word is able to come and find you and to redirect you and set you on a new path on his power. God's word has the power to give us new vision and to breathe new dreams and possibilities in side of us so that you and I may hold on to what Pastor Daniel has been speaking about, speaking over our, our house, speaking over our lives for the past couple of months, a word out of Proverbs 23 and verse 18, your future is bright and filled with a living hope that will never fade away. Sometimes when I hear that, I get a little jittery, I I get a little bit of a tick, because I'm thinking, God, is that even possible? Is our future bright when we look around us? Because all around us, it just feels dark. Well, I've come to tell you that it is possible for us to hold on and believe that there is a hope that will never fade away. But I want us just to pause for a moment before we go further into God's word, and just to stop where we are. And I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes. Um, You can leave it open if you've got a child with you and you need to slip it, that's okay. But I wanna just invite you to close your eyes. Just relax into the seat that you're sitting on. Just allow yourself to feel that seat, get grounded in it. And I want you just to become aware of God who is with you where you are. Right there. And the God who is with you now says, I'm gonna be with you in 2022. And as you notice and become aware of God who is with you, become aware of how he's looking at you. With a gaze of love, no judgment. No condemnation. Just notice. Father, thank you that in this moment we could just pause and allow everything to settle. The voices, the noise, the busyness, the distractions, the hurriedness. Maybe a worry and a concern that we have for a child or a marriage relationship. And we could just pause and ground ourselves in this truth, God, that you look at us with eyes of love and acceptance. Help us knowing that, that our hearts would be open, our mind, our entire being would be open to receiving your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. What helps us to believe that prophetic word that God gave Pastor Daniel for our house, the future is bright, I'm doing a new thing. What helps us to hold on to that truth is actually the title of my sermon this morning. Last week, Pedro spoke about a living hope, and this morning, I want to talk about stubborn hope. Now, (laughs) I said this to the first congregation and to the congregation online, don't switch off because I'm using the word stubborn. I know that stubborn can have a negative connotation, Um, And so I went to the dictionary to go look up what what that word, how it's defined in the dictionary, and it's defined as someone who is obstinate, mulish, unmoving, refusing to change. And as I was reading it and preparing, I thought, oh, I actually recognize some of those traits in me. Just this past couple of weeks, I have what Pedro calls a stubborn cough. My doctor, when I went to go see him, in the week said to me, Bobby, you have a 100-day cough. How's that for stubborn? (laughs) I'm thinking, wow, in one year I would have coughed for 200 days (laughs) because of COVID. And so a stubborn cough. Now the word stubborn has been a word that has kept recurring for me in the context of hope. It was some years ago, I was doing a two-year training course in in spiritual direction and companionship, and uh, we were a group of about 26 participants on this course from all walks of life, mostly pastors, dominies, psychologists, and that, and we were on this course, and we were um, sitting in one of our training sessions when one of our facilitators came into the group and said, can we just stop for a moment, and can I ask that we pray? 
right now where we are. We just got news, this is on a farm where this retreat center is. We just got news that um, one of our neighboring farm, uh, farmers was murdered and his wife sent a message to us if we could pray. And it was right there and then that we just, we stopped and we paused and we went into the prayer. And the leader, as we were going into prayer, said, oh, we must hold on to hope and not despair, give in to despair in this difficult time. And when we had finished, in, finished praying, one of our visiting lecturers got up and she says, no, it's not just hope that we need in a time like this. We need more than hope. We need a stubborn hope in these dark and despairing times. And so that word has stuck with me, it's been with me. We need a stubborn hope. We need a hope that is mulish and obstinate and will not move and to give in when all around us the circumstances might look dark and you're thinking, is the future bright? What are you, dense? Can you not see the reality of it, that actually it's dark and it doesn't look like anything's working out? A stubborn hope says, you know what, I take the facts and the promises of God's word, and the facts must give in and cave to what God's word says, not the other way around. That must cave and give in. Why? Because we have a stubborn, a stubborn hope. And as a, and as a people and, a, and followers of Jesus, as a country, I don't know about you, we need a stubborn hope. And Paul reflects the stubborn hope when he is writing to the Christians at Corinth who were facing difficult um, and trying circumstances. In fact, the, it, it was a dark time, a despairing time, and nothing seemed to be looking good there. And he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 15, and he says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. The modern mice spin on it is, have a stubborn hope. Let nothing move you. Give yourself fully to God. And then he's writing to the church in Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he says, So then, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, hold fast, keep a strong grip, and God, by his grace, will give you the eternal comfort and a wonderful hope. Paul says, Let nothing move you. Give yourself fully. Stand firm. A stubborn hope. The other words that the writers of Scripture uses, and I'm going to bring it, words that are, 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 are familiar to you to describe sub, stubborn hope is the word endure, persevere, being determined, standing firm, if something that will sustain you when it looks like all around you the ground is giving way. Now, this stubborn hope is what helps us to stand our ground when everything around you. Now listen, don't base your hope on CNN or Sky or ENCA, please. Don't allow yourself to get too absorbed in that because it'll take you to a place that you don't want to go to. But a stubborn hope helps us to stand our ground when everything around us is trying to tell us that we are wrong to believe that the future is right. Don't be stupid. When you hear those voices that say, don't be naive, things are never going to change, ever. You are never going to overcome that struggle. Don't be foolish. Look, God didn't come through for you in 2021. What makes you think that he's going to come through for you now in 2022? God didn't come through, you, through for you with your dreams, your desires, your longings, your yearnings that you had, and you thought 2021 is going to be the year. And here we are. The, at the start of a new year, and those are some of the things that you've brought in with you into 2022. Those voices, you know those voices, right? I know it very well. What, the future's bright? I'm doing a new thing? What have you been smoking? <laughs> but a stubborn hope, a stubborn hope helps us to hold up the facts, the reality and the promises of God's word, and the facts that what's happening around us must give in to God's word. So in the early days of this new year, I want to encourage us that we need a stubborn hope. I need it. I need it when I look around me and I think, my goodness, nothing's changing. It looks like, whoa, in fact, we are down another hole here. 
because she see it as the stubborn hope that is going to help us on our journey for 2022. And I've, not, I've deliberately not used language to get us through 2022, because I believe that a stubborn help can help us to show up in 2022, be present to it, fully experience all that it has for us. Because there are things we can't control in 2022 to experience and to live out our faith journey in a wholesome way. Stop and hope that it'll help you to see the new beginnings, new stirrings, a little whisper, a little movement. If I think I was, I was walking the other day and on hard concrete, just concrete all around me, and there was a little bit of a green shoot coming up through the concrete, and I thought, that's the stirrings. That's a stubborn hope that can see it when all around me, everything else looks contrary to that. A stubborn hope that believes that God is doing a new thing, that we will move from stagnancy to risking again. A stubborn hope that is able to see the beauty in the mess, that will uh, able to enable you to get up again and again and again and again. And for the hundredth and the thousandth and the millionth time, that is what stubborn hope does for us. A stubborn hope that sees the joy and the sorrow, the possibility, the dreams the new ventures that waits for us in 2022. You see, it takes stubborn hope to believe what God says in his word in Isaiah 43, 19. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not see it? Another word is perceive it. I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God is at work in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of despair, in the midst of a country that it looks like it's going one way, a global world that has gone crazy. God is at work in the middle of our pandemic. He is at work. And it's a stubborn hope that helps us to see it. It takes stubborn hope to believe God and his promises. So I wanna take a moment quickly to define for us what I mean what hope is. You see, hope is not just wishful thinking or optimism. It's not that. You see, wishful thinking is just that. You know what it's like when you sit, we're sitting around the dinner table and we would often do this as a family said, you know what, if I won the lotter and if I won 50 million, Luke, you're gonna get so much and Joel, you're gonna get so much and Daniel, you're gonna get so much and to my friend in the UK, you're gonna get so much and that's called wishful thinking, okay? That's not hoping you're gonna win the lotto ticket, that's wishful thinking. But neither is hope optimism. You see, optimism is actually linked to, uh, uh, um, and can be attributed to somebody's temperament. You know, those kind of people who are, 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 are optimists. We've got a friend who's an optimist. He's actually a wonderful person to do, be around. He's positive about everything, but he actually has very little hope. Very little hope. And then we have another friend who's actually what I would call a pessimist. You know, those kind of Eeyore personalities and you want to say, for goodness sake, tell your face to smile. That has just been a profound moment, you know. And yet, he's full of hope. Full of hope. So, so that's optimism. It has got nothing to do with hope. You see, hope is something far more than wishful thinking or optimism. Hope is actually based in an object, in in a source. Hope is based in a person and the promises of that person. And that person, that that source, that, that object is the person of God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one whom Paul describes. And with this one verse I wanna leave you for 2022 that I wanna invite you to take into 2022 is Colossians chapter one. And I'm gonna read from 16 through to 17. Listen to what it says. Our hope is in this source, in this person. Everything got started in him and finds purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into being. In other words, he's the eternal God, the pre-existing God before anything came into being. And he holds it all together right up to this moment of the 9th of January, 2022. How profound is that? There's this eternal God who has been around, who didn't just create and then left us all to get up to our own shenanigans and nonsense, but the God who is intimately, creatively involved with all of us and our lives and the world. 
I believe that somebody needs to hear that this morning. It's what I've been speaking over my life. You're saying, Bobby, my life is falling apart. I've been, you, you have no idea. I want to encourage you this morning. Christ holds it all together. If you would allow him to. I sent a message to my friend who's sitting at the deathbed of our husband, slowly seeing him just decimated, a man who was once vibrant and full of life. And I sent her this verse. I said, I want you to experience the God who's just holding you right now, holding your husband that's going to be passing soon, holding your grief and your sorrow, holding your fears about the future, holding your children. He's the God who holds us. But I also want to say this about hope, in, to define hope. You see, hope is not simply about a strong will or having nerves of steel. Well, you know, you think, well, I'm going to just tough it out. I'm going to grit my teeth. I'm going to clench my, and I'm going to just tough it out. I love what Job says because he captures it for us <coughs> in chapter 6 and verses 8, and it will come up on the screen. He says, where is the strength to keep my hope up? What future do I have to keep going? Do you think I have nerves of steel? Do you think I'm made of iron? Do you think I can pick myself up by my bootstrap? Why? I don't even have boots. It's got nothing to do with your will alone. Listen to me. Hope has got everything to do with a God who is greater, bigger, and stronger than you. The God who's able to hold all that is going on in your world. And I can well imagine some of the stuff that is going on in your world. And God says, I'm able to hold, I'm able to hold that. I'm able to hold your grief. I'm able to hold your fear, your doubts, your sadness, your loss. I'm able to hold your dreams and your desires and your longings. I'm even able to hold your brokenness. I've been so encouraged as I've been going through scripture, sitting with this this meditation reflecting on, the, on this truth of stubborn hope and going through the scriptures and seeing the many examples in scriptures of women and men who had stubborn hope. And there's this beautiful example of two very ordinary women, very ordinary, two midwives. See stubborn hope in these two women who refused to bow to Pharaoh's command to kill every newborn baby and as a result, Moses' life was saved. How did they do something like that? It was a stubborn hope, a fear of God, holding on to the hope of deliverance. Ruth, who refused to walk away from Naomi to perhaps better prospect, but made the decision to walk with Naomi in her grief. She had a stubborn hope that there was a better future for her and her mom-in-law. And then Esther, in chapter four of the book of Esther, who could utter words, the most profound words, you think, where does it come from, a young woman like that? If I perish, I perish. She had a stubborn hope inside of her that her God would make a way for his people. And then, I love this, Mary, I love the words of Mary, thinking and praying in the Advent season, and we've just recently been talking about her, Mary, the mother of Jesus. She utters the most profound words be it unto me. After the angel comes to her, tells her not to be afraid, tells her what's going to happen, and then she, she, she surrenders to that moment and says, be it unto me. How could she say words like that? It was because of a stubborn hope. She could say that, be it unto me, a stubborn hope in a God who would walk with her through her son's growth, development, and suffering, even suffering of a cross, who a stubborn hope that she was going to see the promise come to pass. And then there's Job. I've spoke about him, just referred to him a little earlier. In chapter 13, he says, even if he killed me, wasn't talking about the enemy. He was talking about God. Even if he killed me, I'd keep on hoping. Job had lost everything. He was struggling to understand what was going on in his life. We know a little bit about his story trying to make sense of it because everything had fallen apart in his world. Everything had gone south. And here he was facing massive disappointment in a place of deep despair, but he held on to a stubborn hope so that he could speak the words, I keep on hoping. But if we are honest here with every single one of these, even Esther or everyone 
Do you know that hope has a way of waning? You know what I mean by that? Of leaking. I love what my one friend says, friend says that high in a moment, hope can be shoplifted. We know about that. <laughs> Just like, whoa, hang on, what happened here? It's gone. And that's, what, that's the reality of it. Our hope leaks. Our hope wanes. We, we, we face a challenge. We, we go into a place because we're human, we're vulnerable. And so that happens to us. Hope wanes. Our hope is sometimes weak at times. And yet God invites us to grow and to develop a stubborn hope that when the circumstances are overwhelming and nothing seems to be working out and we're thinking, my God, how are we going to get through, dear Lord Jesus, through through 2022, it's early days. We feel like we've hit dead ends and disappointment. We still don't have a job. And that's when we need stubborn hope. This morning I want to share with you just some thoughts, but there's a key thought that I want you to take with you into 2022. Building on what Pedro brought last week when he spoke about a living hope. I want to encourage you. And I pray that this will find you where you are. Maybe you're saying, Bobby, my hope is weak. I'm struggling. My prayer is that it is possible for us to develop a more stubborn hope. Stubborn hope that is a trust in what God has said and will do in spite of the evidence to the contrary. Here's the evidence and the facts, but here's God's word. And that has to give way to the truth of who God is. And we can hold on to that, it's a stubborn hope. God, I'm not denying what's going on. I know that things are in a mess. I'm not pretending. I'm not turning a blind. I'm not singing Kumbaya, my Lord, and, and sitting on a mountaintop and just wishing, wishing. That's wishful thinking. But hope, a stubborn hope says, yes, the facts, but yes, the truth of God's word. Stubborn hope is trusting what God has done and will do in spite of the evidence to the contrary. And my prayer is that this thread, this truth will find you where you are are as you face the challenges of 2022. I've discovered, and this is what I want to bring this morning, that the crucial place where stubborn hope is developed, where stubborn hope is strengthened, if maybe you say, Bobby, I have very little hope, where stubborn hope is formed is what, and I'm going to use the one word called solitude. Now, don't shut down on me just like on that word stubborn. That word solitude, you know what solitude means, which is actually quite a foreign concept in the world in which we live today with the busyness and and social media and the noise and 24 seven access to all of this, these voices that are, that's out there. Solitude simply means this, that place that you've carved out, the space that you've created so that you can spend time alone with God. It's you and God time. It's that time where you show up. You're saying, Bobby, but I've got nothing to say. You know that I don't even want to be here. Do you know that I've got to get that meal? But pray, showing up, sitting down, saying, God, I'm here. I'm here. I've got nothing. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. It's a space that you've created for God to meet with you and for you to meet with your God. I've seen this, this kind of a stubborn hope developed in the lives of others. I've seen it in Pedro's life. That day after day after day, through the different seasons, the ups and downs, through when there has been fullness and emptiness, that stubborn hope that we just show up, that time of solitude. And it's as we practice this discipline, this habit, call it what you like, of solitude, our time alone with God, where we are reading his word, taking a verse out of the gospels, or whatever, wherever it is that you've got your devotional reading, and sitting with that sitting with it, reading it, reflecting on it, praying it. In your time of silence, you know what's happening? And you might feel like nothing's happening. God is at work inside of you. And in that place, there's stubborn hope that is growing and developing. Because it's as you, when you come into that place, just as you are vulnerably, honestly, with all of your frailty, all of your struggles, and saying, God, I'm not sure that I even want to be here. It's as you come, as you come, God is saying, you know what, I desire to hear what is going on in your life. I want to know what's going on in your heart and what's on your mind. Come and tell me. 
That's what we mean by prayer and, and, and our relationship with God. You know, that's what Job did. There was a time when you read the scriptures in Job. Job is out there with his friends and they're having this, this power session. They're talking about what's going on. They bring in their counsel and advice. And eventually Job has enough and he says, oh, no. I've got to go in that place where I can talk to my God with what's going on in my world. He did that. And it was in that time that Job could bring his questions. And boy, did Job have questions. That he could bring his pain and what had gone down in his life. That he could bring his tears and even his howling and saying, God, I don't understand. And it was in that place, in that time, that Job was to discover how God felt about him. He was going to meet God in a new way. How that God loved him that God cared about him, that however Job came didn't change how God felt about him, that God was committed to him, even when his life looked like it was the exact opposite and things were not going according to plan to Job's agenda and Job's wishes and desires, but Job could come and be reminded of that. You see, in this place of solitude, you and I get to discover, like Job was to discover, you see those places where these friends were not necessarily safe spaces, but when he got into that place of solitude and time with God, that it was a safe place. It was there that he discovered that God, how God felt about him. I love what Peter Greich, Peter Greich is an author who, who's written some of the most fantastic work on prayer, and he's actually got a prayer app called Lectia 365, which is absolutely brilliant. He said, he made this profound statement talking about solitude, that time that you carve out and you make space for God, where it's you and God, you're saying, Bobby, if you only know my life right now, for you, with, with young children, I understand. Of course I understand. But this is my heart to you. Wherever you are, make space for God. Create space. If it's in your car, if it's in the, in, 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 in the garden or somewhere, but carve out that time where it's your God. And Peter Greich says this, that the greatest discovery you will ever make is the love of the Father. And prayer is the place of that discovery and everything, your service, your sacrifice, your time, your commitments, your giving, everything flows from that place. Everything. It's in that place of prayer where we are reminded. Because, you know, there's so many voices. Uh, there's your own internal voice of self-rejection. See, you've messed up again. You've messed up again. Look, at you failed again. What's wrong with you? You're never going to overcome this thing. You feel like you're never, never going to win God's love and His approval. But it's in that place where stubborn hope de is developed as you become more secure and more confident in this God who loves you. And no matter what you do, are you saying, Bobby, is God light on, on sin? No, no, no. God takes sin very seriously. That's why he sent his son. But it's in that place where you can become more secure and confident in his love and acceptance of you. We see, we discover God's stubborn love for us can hold our questions, like it held Job's questions. That God's stubborn love, because in that place of prayer and solitude, we encounter a God who has a stubborn love. Isn't that beautiful? And that stubborn love can hold our questions like it held Job's. It can hold our pain, it can hold our doubt. It can hold your fear, your confusion, and it can even hold your weakness and your sin, where? In that place of solitude. It's in that place of solitude that you and I get to discover afresh over and over and over again, and we need that. We need that, because it's in that place we counteract uh, the voices, our own voices that says, you're no good, just look at you, you're gonna mess up again. And we hear afresh that God loves us and will never give up on us. That is a God who himself became vulnerable and understands our vulnerability and says, I'll sit with you in that place. 
I'll be with you even in the darkness. And it's in that place of solitude, our time that's carved out, it's you and God time, where God comes and the Holy Spirit comes and strengthens you. He comes and renews you. He says to you, I'm gonna help you to get up, to keep moving, to keep believing, to sh keep showing up. It's there that he whispers to you, you will rise over and over and over. It's not over. You see, it's in that place that there's the profound, when you come to this awakening and this realization, it's in that place that God says, I see you. I see you. It was a profound moment when Rahab had that, when she, the, 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 the servant of, of Abram and his wife Sarah, when she had that moment, Hagar. I see you, I've been seen by God. I hear you. I'm close to the broken heart, and I'm the God who knows suffering because I've entered it. I know your suffering. See, it's in that place of solitude. This is why it's so critical, church, and I want us to hold on to this moment that God by his spirit is working. Are you saying he's not working when we gather here on a Sunday? Yes, it's good that we gather. We need the family, we need our community, we need to be encouraged, but this is not enough for you to grow in your confidence and the security of the love of God. It's in that place where that we discover the love of God in that place of prayer, where God reminds us over, you might be loved delighted in you, my favor's on you, I love you, accept you, I've chosen, you're precious to me. It's in that place that God is working by his spirit, empowering us just like he did for his son. Do you know that it was the practice of Jesus' life? Every day he would go and be with his father, he would withdraw, get into a place where it's just him and his father. And you, I was often think, so what's he, what's he talking about to his father? He's talking about the very things that you and I talk about. Our struggle. So he goes into that place in the garden. He's alone with his father. He's in a time of solitude. It was on the night that he was betrayed when he's in the garden and he begins to pray and talk to his father with what is in his heart and what's on his mind. And he's praying and he's wrestling and he's saying, God, this is what lies ahead of me. The suffering, the cross is there. And he wrestles and he brings and he pours out his heart and all his fears and concerns until he comes to a place of surrender and cries that not my will, but your will be done. Where did that happen? With the 12? With his community? No, that was just him and his father. It was in that place of solitude. Because you see, in that place of solitude, God who is waiting is doing a work of forming and shaping and reshaping us by his spirit. I love what Romans 5, 5 says. For we know how dearly God loves us. How do we know that? So it's one thing telling somebody, but it's another thing where it becomes a reality in your spirit, in your entire being, that when you've messed up and when you've failed, it doesn't change how God sees and feels about you. For we know how dearly God loves us, not just a head knowing, but a heart knowing, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Another translation says that he has poured his love into our hearts by, through his Holy Spirit. Where does that happen? Yes, you'll have some pouring here yeah, when we gather on a Sunday, when you're part of your life group where hope is practiced, actually there's some pouring. But the pouring out in your heart takes place in solitude in that place of your time with God. You see, knowing this, that I'm loved by God, knowing that I'm accepted, knowing that God sees me, knowing that God sits with me in my suffering, brings me out, has the power of bringing you out of despair. Saying, God, I'm not, I don't understand. This is not what I signed up for. But I know, I love that verse, that everything is working together for good. Everything. Everything, because God holds all things. Everything is held by Him. I've been reading the life of Eugene Peterson for many years now. I've read a good couple of his books, but the thing that he's most famous for is the message translation of the Bible that he did many years ago. Anybody have that? If you don't have it, you can get it on your version on your app, or you can go buy one at Kum, a copy. No, I'm dead serious. Take that with you into the place of solitude. 
take the New Living Translation, take whatever, but take that with you. And so I've been reading the life of Eugene P Peterson, a man who has influenced millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of people who died, in fact, at the age of 85 on the 22nd of September in 2018. It was at his funeral service that his second son left, got up to give the eulogy. This is what he spoke at his father's funeral. He said, you know, my dad had only one message for 29 years. He was a pastor. For 29 years, one message in his pastoral ministry, and that for all of the books that he wrote, and he wrote many books. He kept sharing this one message. It was a secret lab said that his dad had let, let him in on very early in his life. It was a message that Leif said his dad had whispered into his heart for 50 years, words he had snuck into his room to say over him as a child over and over and over. And when I was reading this and reflecting, I thought of the times when my boys were growing up, young, just young, Luke, Joel, and Daniel. And Pedro would go to their room at their doors and outside the doors. In fact, he would go in when they were sleeping, stand at their bed, and he would pray over them. When Luke was in an outside room and he would go and stand outside the window and Luke probably thought his dad is a lurker here and we'd go and pray over him. And this is what Eugene Peterson prayed over his children as they slept. God loves you, the great Eugene Peterson. God loves you. God is on your side. He's coming up to you. He's relentless. Let me tell you, it takes a stubborn hope. It takes a deep work for you to allow that truth and to hold on and believe that truth because everything inside of us says, no, God can't love me because of this. I've messed up again. I'm not worthy of his life. Bobby, you, you know, I'm the biggest sinner in town. You have no idea what's going on in my life. God loves you. God is on your side. He's coming after you. He's relentless. He's never going to give up. He's God is the hand of heaven. There's a poem. He's the hand of heaven who will chase you down the byways and the highways of life. He will never, ever give up on you. Where does that become a reality in our lives? It's in that place of solitude where we learn how much we are loved, held, treasured by God. You see, in that place of solitude, you experience the reality of God's stubborn love. He's never gonna give up on you. And as you experience his stubborn love, you know what's growing inside of you? A stubborn hope. There's nothing that I can do that will change how God feels about me. We don't always believe it. And that's why it takes that daily time with God where you go sit with him like his son did and the father whispered over in your mind, delighted in you. You bring me delight. You bring me joy. We don't believe that. So as I bring my message to a close on the second Sunday of the new year, I want to invite you to make this a priority in your life for 2020. Maybe you're sitting here and saying, Bobby, but I do pray. I do have my devotion and I do this. I want to talk about take it into a place of solitude where there's stillness, where there's silence, where you're sitting there with God and letting God work in you, just reaffirming over your life how much He loves you, how He's working for you, how He's caring for you. Make it a priority. And maybe you're saying, Bobby, I don't know how to do that. Make contact with our office. We'd love to sit with you and take a moment and say, come on, let me show you how. Start with a few minutes. Open your Bible. Read a verse. Read a verse. Maybe it is blind bottom as what do you want me to do for you? God, this is what I need. And be open to him because it's in that place that you will develop a stubborn hope that will help you to face the unknowns, the challenges that awaits us in 2020. And that we will not run and hunker down and pull things down and say, oh, let me just stay here while we get through it. No, that you will show up and experience all that God has for you in the middle of it. You see, the stubborn hope will help you to hold on to the promises when everything is looking contrary to what God has promised for you. So I want us to take a moment 
And this is your time to talk with God. So I'm going to invite you just to close your eyes. But quietly, not aloud, but just mentally. Take a moment and talk to God. Tell God that you need help in this area. Tell God that you want to grow in this area to deepen it. Tell Him that you desire to meet with Him daily. Or maybe you don't have the desire. Ask God to give you the desire to desire to be with Him. Ask Him. Right now. Ask Him to help you to sharp daily to be with Him. I love what Philippians 2.13 says for God. Listen, it's all of God. But it says you show up for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Tell God what you need grace for for 2022 when it comes to this time alone with Him. Father, thank you that you do hear the cries of our hearts and we can bring to you, Lord, maybe this is an area that we've struggled with or we haven't even ventured into or we've slacked off and with the holidays and yet, God, you're calling us to deepen that, for it to be deepened in our life, that will become a daily reality where we set aside time, our solitude, our stillness, our prayer time to be with you. I pray for your grace for each one of us. In Jesus' name. And just, I want to take a moment. Maybe you're here and online and you're saying, Bobby, I've never, I haven't started. I don't know the reality of that kind of a relationship with this God you've been talking about. Today, he invites you to come. He invites you to take a step. God has already taken a leap across all time to come and find you where you are. He said to me, what must I do? It simply starts with a prayer of childlike faith. Dear Lord Jesus. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Will you take control of my life? That's it. And if you're ready to do that, I'm going to pray for you right now. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you know our heart, you know our mind, but that we could come and express our desire to enter into a living relationship with you. Will you help us as we take the step today and to go on this journey of following you? In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. We have come to the end of our, service, of our service, but I have a prayer, a blessing that I want to pray over you, and it's going to be on our social media. So I want to invite you to stand, to get into a different position and to have a posture of openness to receive this blessing over your life. It's a blessing of hope by Jan Richardson, and it says this, so may we know the hope that is not just for today not just for someday, but for this day. Yeah, now, in this moment, that opens to us. Hope not made of wishes, but of substance. Hope made of sinew and muscle and bone. Hope that has breath and a beating heart. Hope that will not keep quiet and be polite. Hope that knows how to holler when it is called for. Hope that knows how to sing when there seems little cause. Hope that raises us up from the dead, not someday, but this day, every day, again and again and again and again and again. A stubborn hope that God wants to develop and grow inside of you as you to make that time for Him. Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you, Justin. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Bobby, for an incredible, incredible word. And as you spoke about earlier, if you made that decision to, to follow God, to accept salvation, I want us to know today that that is probably the best decision that you can make. It says in the Bible that the angels are celebrating it. We want to celebrate with you. So if that is you, know that you are part of the family now. We are so grateful for the decision that you made. And whilst it is a personal decision, we know that God calls us to live in community and we want to take an opportunity to walk alongside you, to do this journey together. 
and we want to be able to put something in your hand. So if you made that decision, we would love to put this in your hand that will just give you a resource, a first step as you go on this journey, this relationship with God. And you can come and um, chat to our pastoral team. We'll be up front at the end of the service or if you can join us in the Guest Connect Lounge outside um, later after the service. Like I said, we have a coffee and a sweet treat if you are new for the first time or maybe it is to chat about someone about this decision that you made. Well, as we go into the rest of the week, we are so excited to see you again next week. Let's hold on to the stubborn hope as we go into the rest of this week. Have a great week, church, and we'll see you back in the building next week. Amen.